Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa, where I take difficult to understand concepts and make them easy to understand. In today's video, we are going to be taking a look at covalent bonds. By the end of the video, you should know what covalent bonds are and the difference between nonpolar covalent bonds and polar covalent bonds. Let's dive right in. Covalent bonds are formed when two atoms share one or more pairs of valence electrons. The strength of the bond depends on the number of shared electrons. Covalent bonds can be single covalent bonds, double covalent bonds, or triple covalent bonds. In a single covalent bond, only one pair of electrons are shared, such as when hydrogen binds to hydrogen. In a double covalent bond, two pairs of electrons are shared. Mostly this occurs with the elements carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And an example of this could be when oxygen binds to oxygen. In a triple covalent bond, there are three pairs of electrons shared. This occurs mostly between the elements carbon and nitrogen, and an example of this would be when nitrogen binds to nitrogen. These are all examples of nonpolar covalent bonds because in all of these examples, the electrons are shared equally. Now, before we move on to what a polar covalent bond is, some of you may not even understand how um, those atoms came together and why some had one pair of electron sharing versus two versus three. So I'm gonna take a minute to explain um, how they're sharing electrons so you can understand that concept a little bit better. And then I'll go on to explain what a nonpolar covalent bond is so you can see the difference between a nonpolar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond. If you already know how all of those atoms bonded, then you can skip ahead to nonpolar covalent bonds. But if you're still confused as to how the bonding occurs, stay right here. We're going to go over it. In order to understand how atoms can take part in bonding, there's a few things that we need to be able to know. And one of them is by looking at the periodic table, we can see that each atom on the periodic table has an atomic number. That atomic number allows us to know how many protons that element or atom has, and therefore, how many electrons it also has. So if we look at hydrogen, hydrogen's atomic number is one, and so therefore there is one proton, and protons are positive, and so there's also one electron. We're concerned with the electrons because the electrons are going to be what's involved in this bonding process. So hydrogen has one electron. The other thing that we need to know is um, what a valence shell is. The valence shell is the outermost shell of an atom where the electrons are. And depending on how many electrons they have, that valence shell can vary. And so it's important to know how many electrons are in the valence shell because that is going to show us how those atoms are going to react with other atoms. So hydrogen is a very simple example because it only has one electron in its valence shell. It only has one electron altogether. So that makes that pretty simple. So hydrogen only has one electron in its valence shell and the, that first valence shell can have a maximum of two electrons. So in order for hydrogen to be nice and happy, it wants two electrons in that outermost valence shell. So when a hydrogen um, molecule binds to another hydrogen molecule, they are going to share their electrons. Um, so they each share one electron, and that's going to give us a single covalent bond. That's pretty straightforward because hydrogen only has one electron. Let's look at what happens with oxygen in its double covalent bond. So if we jump over to oxygen, we'll see that oxygen now has eight um, electrons. Well, it has eight protons. That number tells us there's protons. There's eight protons. 
which would then tell us that there's eight electrons. So with oxygen, we're going to have a little bit of a different story. If we put oxygen here and we fill that first shell with two electrons, because that's all that can go in the first shell, but in the second shell, the second shell gets full with eight electrons. Now, um, oxygen has eight total, so we already drew two, so now we can draw six more. Okay, so oxygen has a total of eight electrons, so it's the inner shell is full with two, and then we have six on the outside. Now this outer shell, to be full, can hold up to eight, okay? So it can hold up to eight um, electrons. So if oxygen comes into contact with another oxygen, it can form a double covalent bond because they are going to share two. Now the innermost shell doesn't matter in this case. I'm just going to draw it so you can see that they're the same. When we're talking about bonding, we're only concerned with the valence shell, so that outermost shell. So oxygen has six in the outermost shell, and they are going to share um, two pairs of electrons in this case, giving each one of them eight electrons in their valence shell so that they're nice and full, they're very stable and happy. So in this case, they are sharing these two outer these two electrons in the outer shell so they are forming a covalent bond um, a covalent double bond with two electrons being shared okay let's now take a look at nitrogen and how it engages in bonding so if you look at nitrogen right here nitrogen has the number seven so the atomic number is seven that's the number of protons, which again tells us the number of electrons. So nitrogen has seven electrons. Let's draw that out and see what it would look like. So we have nitrogen. We can fill that innermost shell with two. Okay, and then we're going to have five more. Remember this valence um, shell can hold eight so we are concerned with this valence shell in the bonding activities so because nitrogen looks like this when nitrogen comes into contact with another nitrogen again i'm just showing you this inner shell so that you can see what it looks like we're not concerned with that one when it comes to bonding these will come together and they're going to share three if we were to add a third shell, if we were to go to some of these higher numbers and add a sh third shell, that third valence shell can also only hold eight. So once we fill this shell with eight, we would have to go to the next number. So anything over 10, anything that has um, the number over 10 would then have to add on a third shell and then that third shell could hold up to eight as well. So hopefully you understand how we're getting these number of electrons. We're only concerned with the valence um, shell and how they're going to interact in bonding. All of these examples are nonpolar covalent bonds because they are equally sharing these electrons um, within the bond that they're forming. So covalent bonds means that they are sharing electrons and in a nonpolar covalent bond, they are equally sharing these electrons. Now let's go ahead and look at polar covalent bonds. In polar covalent bonds, there is an unequal sharing of electrons. And in order to understand this concept and also how we can have polar versus nonpolar covalent bonds forming, we have to understand what electronegativity is. Electronegativity is an atom's affinity for electrons or how much that atom wants those electrons. This also coincides with that idea of the valence shell. So an atom whose valence shell is closer to being full is going to have more electronegativity or more greed, more want to have electrons than an atom whose um, valence shell isn't close to being full. The way the periodic table is set up, 
and I put it up here for you to see one more time, is that electronegativity will increase as we move to the right. So that atoms on the right side are more electronegative. They are closer to having their um, valence shell full. And so they want those atoms more than those on the left-hand side. If we pair two atoms that are unequal in their electronegativity, we will end up with a polar covalent bond. So the examples that I had shown you before, um, those atoms were equal in their electronegativity, but if we pair two up that are unequal in their electronegativity, they will form a polar covalent bond. Let's take a closer look at an example of a polar covalent bond. We can look at water. So water contains two hydrogens and one oxygen. I'm going to put my periodic table back up here so that you can see hydrogen is over here with the atomic number one. Remember telling us that it has one proton but also one electron. Oxygen is over here with a um, atomic number of eight and telling us it has eight electrons. What you'll also notice is that oxygen is very right in comparison to hydrogen, so it's right on the periodic table. So oxygen has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen only has one electron in its valence shell. Yes, its valence shell only needs two to be full, but oxygen is one shell up with six in its outer shell. And so because of that, oxygen really, really wants those electrons um, so that it can fill its valence shell with eight and be full. So oxygen's electronegativity is much greater than hydrogen's. And because of this, when they come together, oxygen and hydrogen, it is going to form a polar covalent bond. I've already drawn out what it would look like when oxygen and hydrogen come together to form water. So remember, oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell. Hydrogen each has one. So they are going to share one pair of electrons each. So if we drew it out with our bonding, it would look like this, with oxygen sharing one pair of electrons with each hydrogen. And um, what happens here is because oxygen is much more electronegative than hydrogen, oxygen is going to pull these electrons much closer to it because it's being greedy, it wants those electrons, so it's going to pull those electrons much closer to itself, resulting in a slightly negative charge on the oxygen's end. Because it's pulling those electrons slightly closer to itself, they're a little bit further from the hydrogens, and that's going to result in slight positive charges on the ends of the hydrogen. This slight charges on the ends leads to a polar molecule and thus results in a polar covalent bond. So when we pair up atoms that have different electronegativities, that will then result in a polar covalent bond. Thank you so much for watching my video. I hope that it helped you to understand what a covalent bond is and the difference between nonpolar and polar covalent bonds. If you have any questions, please make sure to put them in the comments below. And if you like this video, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and share with your friends so that I can continue making these easy to understand videos. Thank you.